With this being the Owls' third bowl appearance in the past three years and fourth since 2011, they are viewing this trip to Florida as more of a business trip than in years past in the hopes that they can add more brass to their trophy case. One player that has really stepped up this season has been wide receiver Isaiah Wright. Now Matt Rule raved about him last year all of the time, but this season he has finally realized his talent as he has found success at an outside receiver position, playing slot receiver, wildcat quarterback, and a little bit of running back. We've got the Winter Olympics going on, which means you won't see fencing. That's for the summer games. But three Temple fencers still got in some Olympic action recently on a smaller stage. Al Sports Update's John Press is live from the Student Pavilion. In a 48-hour period over the weekend, the gymnastics team set not one, not two, but three program records. And this all came at home in two separate meets. The Owls were hindered on Saturday by untimely turnovers, drops, and penalties throughout the game. They also went 0 for 2 on fourth down when they were in field goal range deep in UConn territory. Rapanch has been named to the all-conference team in each of the past two seasons. This, along with her participation in the tryout, could garner national attention for the Owls. The Owls are headed back to Florida and back to the postseason for the third consecutive year. But this year is a little different because the Owls aren't just going bowling, they're going mowing. From Boca to Annapolis over Temple. to St. Petersburg, Florida, a new adventure awaits the Owls in the Bad Boy Mowers Gasparilla Bowl. Although they didn't make it to this point without their share of challenges, most notably injuries and slow starts, the leadership on the team thinks that fighting through those shortcomings has been beneficial for the squad. You build the team off of things that you go through with each other. So I feel like, yeah, we're definitely one of the most close-knit teams and things like that. So it's going to feel special having that last game with each other. It's a great feeling, you know, that the team uh, answered the, the, the challenge from the seniors, you know. It was one of our goals at the, end, the beginning of the season to get to a bowl game and win that bowl game. With this being the Owls' third bowl appearance in the past three years and fourth since 2011, they are viewing this trip to Florida as more of a business trip than in years past in the hopes that they can add more brass to their trophy case. 2015, when we played Toledo, honestly, I think we were more happy to be there than ready to compete. 2016, we, we wanted to compete, but, you know, we just came up short. Um, this, this we, we've got all the experience necessary. This should be the one. The Owls feel that they are in an even better position to succeed in the bowl game than in years past, thanks to head coach Jeff Collins' extensive postseason experience. I mean, he's been 12 straight. He's been to the past 12, so he's got the experience. He knows how to handle those trips. He knows how to handle the games, the media, and all of that. So we follow his lead. We do. We follow his process. We'll be fun. Now, Jeff Collins is no stranger to FIU, as he was the Panthers' defensive coordinator back in 2010 when the team won its only bowl victory, the Little Caesars Pizza Bowl. A great bowl name, by the way. Reporting live from Edberg Olson Hall, I'm Jonathan Gilbert. Just as quickly as Temple Lacrosse was on a winning streak, their fortunes changed, and they are now on a three-game losing streak. They lost big on the road against Marquette and Florida before hosting UConn on Saturday afternoon. UConn came into this one at 5-7 and seven on a three-game losing streak, but things went south for the Owls quickly. Kelsey Catalano gets the scoring started 20 seconds into the game on her way to tying a program record with eight goals for the Huskies. And Caitlin Leary beats Kelsey Hershey from the free position to put UConn up eight. Olivia Miles beats Marin Lowell back into the game from the free position to put the Huskies up 10, 13 to three. UConn cruises in this one, beating the Owls 16 to seven. Charles Dickens once told us, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. In the book, A Tale of Two Cities. Well, very few people are aware that Dickens was also talking about the lacrosse team in its tale of two streaks. After a four-game win streak earlier in the season, the Owls were celebrating the best of times at 7-3. But the season has taken a turn for the worst of times thanks to a three-game losing streak with losses against Marquette, Florida, and UConn. Over those three games, the Owls have been outscored by a total of 47-14. Dave Patton, who has really opened up the playbook after the first half of the season, 
and I don't know if that's in part to Frank Nutile performing well, but he's just been way more liberal with his play calling. And who wouldn't want to go to Florida in the middle of December? Jeff Collins, going back to where he came from, he was the defensive coordinator of Florida, he'll be returning, and Temple has a ton of players returning to Florida from Florida, and they have such a strong recruiting base there. And now play number three, once again in the red zone, you see Perry go in motion, but they hand it off to fullback Anthony Gargiano, who takes it up the middle for Navy's third touchdown, and we'll watch it again. He is the single setback as Perry goes in motion. It's handed off, and he trucks up the middle. Jake Hawk and Robert Lindsay here, the two midshipman interior offensive linemen, form a massive hole for him to go through. Else have eked their way into bowl eligibility. They are the seventh out of seven teams in the American to earn a postseason road trip. And it was in part to a strong finish to the year as the Owls won three of their last four games. Well, I started the program when I first got here. We had a, there was a club, but there was no team. And so I started the team, and we were basically trying to get girls to come out of, you know, out of the fencing class. No, we had girls who had no experience. My first All-American was someone who was a field hockey player and had never fenced before. Going from that, going from there were no scholarships, there was no NCAA women's fencing. And so going from that to where we are today and being a top-ranked team in the country, uh, we've come a long way. And how fulfilling is that for you to see that growth? I mean, it's pretty much very attributed to you and just to see what the program has become. Well, the program is really important to me. It's, it's, it's part of me. And so it's something that I'm very, very proud of what we've been able to accomplish. 800 wins is a pretty gaudy number. How did you get here? What's, what's the secret? Uh, hard work. I mean, we, we bring uh, women into our program that uh, really want to succeed and want to be part of a winning program. Uh, who are coachable, who believe in a team philosophy, and support each other and, and really want the best for each other. And, and that's very important to us as a coaching staff. And then all the coaches that I've had work with me over the years, uh, no one could do this alone. You, you have to have the support of all your other coaches, and they've done a great job. What are your expectations for this round of the Temple Invitational? You know, we're coming to the end of the season now, and so we really want the, the girls to be peaking. Uh, this is a very strong tournament, probably one of the strongest tournaments that we would have fenced in all year. And so at the end of the season, you know, this is where we have to show, okay, what have we learned? How much have we improved as the year went on? So I'm expecting good things, but it's going to be very tough, and the girls have to mentally, as well as physically, uh, be ready for the pressure that they're going to feel coming into that meet and then into our postseason tournaments.